On this week in our prize tech, we have Mr. Brian Chi and Mr. Curtis Franklin on the show today. Now, we've been talking about market trends on different episodes here on Twilight, but this week we're going to talk about a potential market that can have an explosion in the coming months. That's identity access management solutions. Plus, we have an exceptional host roundtable today. Remote work and working from home has changed the very shape of people's networks and organizations' network perimeters. Today, we're going to talk about network hardware for your home and your small business. And we're going to take you through the full spectrum of devices and the offerings out there. So you definitely shouldn't miss it. It's Wyatt on the set. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twyatt. This Week at Enterprise Tech, episode 501, recorded July 8th, 2022. My firewalls on a boat. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Give your team an engaging IT development platform to level up their skills. Volume discounts start at five seats. Go to itpro.tv slash enterprise. Make sure to mention Enterprise 30 to your designated IT Pro TV account executive to get 30% off or more on a business plan. And by userway.org. UserWay is the world's number one accessibility solution, and it's committed to enabling the fundamental human right of digital accessibility for everyone. When you're ready to make your site compliant, deciding which solution to use is an easy choice to make. Go to userway.org slash twit for 30% off UserWay's AI-powered accessibility solution. And by New Relic. That next 9 p.m. call is just waiting to happen. Get New Relic before it does. And you can get access to the whole New Relic platform and 100 gigabytes of data per month free forever. No credit card required. Sign up at newrelic.com slash enterprise. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Moreska, your guide through this big world of the enterprise. I can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in the professionals and the experts, starting with our very own Mr. Brian Cheese, net architect at Sky Fiber and all around tech geek. Chebert, how are you, my friend? Any uh, projects that you can share with us this week? Uh, I'm slowly cleaning up the garage so I can go put another rack in and I want to set up my 3D printers. Then I discovered... <sighs> Man, does it get hot in there. So I'm also working <laughs> on putting in some temperature-controlled exhaust fans to try and get I the um, temperature under control. Now, how many do you have? You said printers with the plural. How many How many machines yeah, do you have? Yeah, I've, I've got... Padre sent me his Dremel and his Monoprice, so I'm going to play around with those and see if I like them. And then I also have a Formlabs 2. And the Formlabs 2, because it, it needs a lot of post-processing. Um, it requires a washer full of 90% or better isopropyl alcohol. And in those kind of heat, that kind of heat, it's going to evaporate butt quick and make it really easy to get drunk just by breathing in my garage. So <laughs> exhaust fans are us. And uh, we'll see how I like those uh, lower end FDM printers. If not, there's some um, pretty good deals on the Lulzbot Taz 6 on eBay. And uh, that that's what I had at UH. Um, and it does a spectacular job, especially since I did a lot of printing with NinjaFlex for things like fiber caps, SFP caps, and things like that. Um, can do some neat stuff with FDM printing that you can't do with an SLA and vice versa. Right, right. I think you've created something new there, drunk by 3D printing. We'll have to see where that goes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Cheaper, for being here. Well, it's always refreshing to have our very own senior analyst at IMDA and our security and enterprise expert. He's Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, I hear that you're uh, neck deep in research. How's that going? Doing well, Lou. Thanks very much. I uh, got some uh, major publishing that's going to be happening later on this month. Been working on that. Uh, also getting ready to head out again. I'll be going to the AWS Reinforced Conference up in Boston later this month. And uh, I'm going to be getting ready, of course, for Black Hat and DEF CON. Those are coming up. So lots of interesting stuff going on. 
Um, and, you know, just to keep things interesting, I'm also working on our 3D printer. We've got an Ender 3 uh, and getting ready to stand up an Octoprint server. So uh, lots of fun happening there. Lots of fun stuff. You guys have lots of fun stuff going on. Well, hopefully uh, hopefully we'll have some fun stuff going on over at the Moresca House pretty soon, too. Thank you, guys. Well, speaking of fun, we have lots of fun stuff this week in the Enterprise. We've been talking about market trends on many of the episodes we have here on the show. But we're going to talk about today a potential market that actually could have an explosion in the coming months. So stick around. We have more information about that. I bet you can't guess what that is. Plus, we have an exceptional round, host roundtable discussion today. Now, remote work and working from home has changed the very shape of a lot of organizations, networks out there, especially the network perimeter. Today, we are going to talk about network hardware for your home and your small business. So lots to talk about there, even the goods and the bad. So stick around because we have lots more to talk about. But before we do, we do have to go ahead and jump in this week's news blips. Now, cloud computing and use of container technology continue to be more prolific in today's business world. Now, Kubernetes is part of that eco because it can make it possible for organizations to improve uptime, efficiency, and overall performance. I don't have to tell you guys that. Now, the devil is in the details there, though. You need a well-orchestrated cluster in order to deliver strong performance and full potential of Kubernetes. Now, the question is, how do you get there? Now, I really like this article that uh, RT Insights wrote and talks about the concept of observability. Now, I'm going to—I'm a big pro- proponent of observability and the reason is is it's when development teams struggle to track the state of their kubernetes or serverless functions or other aspects of their cloud architectures they need to address through the problem and that's lack of observability now the thing is to understand about observability is that it's not just a single product that we're talking about here it doesn't focus on logging or just metrics there's no turnkey or off-the-shelf solution there observability is the idea of how long your team spends trying to actually understand a problem it's pretty simple the longer you spend the more less productive you are, the more money it costs. And you have a dashboard or a loading system that gives you the root of, plop, root of the problem. Um, then, then you have, then you're not really using the idea of observability. So, when organizations increase the use of microservices in their architectures, or they're simultaneously increasing their surface area and frequency of software changes. While these adjustments are made in the name of efficiency, they also bring about an increased need of visibility into what their cloud applications or their infrastructure is doing. Now, close monitoring is not only needed to identify anomalies when they occur, but also to understand the excess capacity the system needs to load balance. So what can organizations do here? Well, there are four benchmarks to me that make sense. First, you can track the overall health and dynamic behavior through standard infrastructure monitoring. Ensure you're tracking dynamic events like new developments or deployments, health checks, and as well as auto scaling. Now, you can also track stats here and can actually help you understand things and what's going on. Now, correlating log data and performance information is important. Most developers like me spend a lot of time switching, context switching between logs and overall monitoring to trace tools. Now, open source observability tools like OpenTelemetry can actually help you connect the dots between the logs and the tools. And it can also help you correlate business intelligence with cluster and infra- infrastructure performance. Now, the last two are a bit more challenging. One is understanding in cluster communication or inter cluster co- communication. You can also do this using Kubernetes metadata and connecting it with OpenTelemetry. That helps you kind of connect the docs between those two. Now, finally, you should be able to track and audit requests through the tech stack. Now, there are a lot of tools out there to do that, and it can be made to display data right next to other telemetry data for visibility. Um, for, in fact, Prometheus monitoring data is an open source example there. Now, Kubernetes and other complex cloud architectures will continue to play a key role in development and engineering. As competition heats up there, Kubernetes observe will become table stakes to minimizing disruption, maintaining velocity, and improving your business performance. Well, the Department of Justice put out a release this week that Honor Oxoy of Miami, Florida, is accused of personally collecting millions off a scam that sold more than $1 billion, that's with a B, in fraudulent Cisco networking equipment to unsuspecting customers. Now, he owned a company called Pro Network Entities that sold refurbished, rehabbed, and modified Cisco gear imported from China and Hong Kong, along with fake yet convincing packaging, labels, and documentation. Between 2014 and 2022, Customs and Border Protection seized approximately 180 shipments of counterfeit Cisco devices being shipped to the Pro Network Entities from China and Hong Kong. In response to some of these seizures, Axoy allegedly falsely submitted official paperwork to CBP under the alias of Dave Durden. 
an identity that he used to communicate with Chinese co-conspirators. And now it's not like Cisco wasn't aware of the scheme and trying to stop it. Between 2014 and 2019, Cisco sent seven letters to Axoya asking him to cease and desist his trafficking in counterfeit goods. Axoy allegedly responded to at least two of these letters by causing his ter- attorney to provide Cisco with forged documents. In all, Axoy allegedly ran at least 19 companies formed in New Jersey and Florida, as well as at least 15 Amazon storefronts, at least 10 eBay storefronts, and multiple other entities, collectively all known as the pro-network entities I mentioned earlier that collectively imported tens of thousands of fraudulent and counterfeit Cisco networking devices from China and Hong Kong and resold them to customers in the United States and overseas, falsely representing the products as new and genuine. Today, Oxoy is charged with one count of conspiracy to traffic in counterfeit goods and to commit mail and wire fraud, three counts of mail fraud, four counts of wire fraud, and three counts of trafficking in counterfeit goods. Well, thank you to PBS for this article. It's about FDA is allowing pharmacists. You don't have to go to um, your doctor, except maybe as a follow-up, but pharmacists can now prescribe the Pfizer COVID-19 pill called Paxlovid. So this, I, I feel this is a terrific mood, move by the FDA, especially since antivirals in general need to be started within just a few days after symptoms first appear. Sadly, the Pfizer product Paxlovid is not approved as a prophylactic like the Tamiflu antiviral. I should add that I've managed to not catch the con flu the last couple of times at CS by twisting my doctor's arm to get a prescription for Tamiflu to take half doses to help prevent catching the, you know, a virus from the crowd. You might want to go and ask Padre how many times he's caught the con flu over the years of CES. Well, and or any big conference. Well, here's an excerpt from the PBS article. Quote, since Paxlovid must be taken within five days after symptoms begin, authorizing state licensed pharmacists to prescribe Paxlovid could expand access to timely treatment, according to FDA Drug Center Director Patricia Cavazzoni. Still, use could be limited by paperwork requirements. Patients are expected to bring their recent health records, including blood tests, and a list of their current medications so pharmacists can check for health conditions and medications that can negatively impact with Paxlovid. As an alternative, uh, pharmacists can consult with the patient's primary care doctor. Well, For the road warriors in our audience, this means catching COVID might no longer mean having to pay atrocious rates in hotel-associated clinics and not get stuck as long as in your, as, as, you know, not as long in your hotel until you can test negative again and travel by air. Just convince a handy pharmacist that you need you meet the criteria and hope that something like Paxlovid will cut the intensity and duration of the virus. Now you probably have heard about the slowdown of Moore's Law. Now, if you remember, Moore's Law is where the speed of computing and the number of transistors was supposed to actually double every couple of years. Unfortunately, transistors are getting to the point of being so small, they can't really remain functional. Well, computing has progressed over the years, but no longer at that speed. Now, that That's where things get interesting. Companies like IBM are trying new techniques to double the speed and capacity of computing to get back on track. Now, the latest 3D chip stacking technology is out there. Now, IBM Research and Tokyo Electron collaborated on a new breakthrough, simplifying the process of producing wafers using 3D chip stacking. Now, they have successfully implemented a new process for producing 300 millimeter silicon wafer chips and making it the world's first. Now, stacking technology commonly has vertical connections between the wafers. Now, normally they use glass wafers that are then removed using ultraviolet lasers later on in the process. Now, IBM and Tells a new process uses a 300 millimeter module with an infrared laser, transparent to the silicon, and allowing standard silicon wafers to be used instead of glass. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means that the new process can actually reduce the strain and complexities in the global chip industry. You know, you may have heard the chip industry is finding it challenging to make chips fast 
and efficiently, especially in the pandemic era. Now, chip stacking is typically only used in high-end operations, such as the production of high bandwidth memory. However, it's got the potential to expand the number of transistors in a very specific volume. Now, this means that Moore's law needs to focus on areas and volume in the coming years. It also means that Moore's law may not be dead just yet. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, we have the bites. But before we get to the bites, we do have to thank a really great sponsor of this week in our price tech, and that's IT Pro TV. Your IT team needs the skills and knowledge to ensure your business is a success. And with IT Pro TV, more than 80% of its users who start a video actually finish it. Now, IT Pro TV is engaging, and your team will enjoy learning on their platform. Give your team the tools they need to make your business thrive. Courses are entertaining and binge worthy, keeping your team interested and invested in learning the whole time. Now, the tech industry is evolving and it's changing rapidly and your team needs to be trained today. And when a new release happens or a system upgrade or even a cyber threat faces your business, IT Pro TV offers the training and perspectives of those disruptions within days, if not hours. Now, what is, why is IT Pro TV right for your business? Good question, right? Well, get all the training and certificates and certifications for your team done all in one place. Now, IT Pro TV has every vendor and skill you need for your team, your IT team training. They provide Microsoft IT training, Cisco training, Linux training, Apple training, security, cloud, and a lot more there. Plus, more than 5,800 hours worth ranging from technical skills to compliance to soft skills. Now you can do so much with IT Pro TV Business Plan. Track your team's results. You can manage your seats, assign and unassign team members, and access monthly usage reports, which is actually really useful. See metrics like logins and view time, tracks completed, and much more. Plus, easily manage teams, manage subsets of users or teams by providing them with customized assignments, monitoring progress, and reporting on the usage of the platform. Plus, assignments can be full courses or even individual courses within courses. Advanced reporting is also there. Get immediate insights into your team's view patterns and progress over any period of time with those visual reports. Now, don't forget that IT Pro TV has individual plans as well. Give your team the IT development platform they need to level up their skills while enjoying the journey. For teams of two to 1,000, volume discounts start at five seats and go to itpro.tv slash enterprise. Make sure you mention Enterprise 30 to your designated IT Pro TV account executive to get 30% off or more on a business plan. And we thank IT Pro TV for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, it's now time for the bites. That's right. There are a number of tech markets that we've talked about in the past that have been trending for a while. Now, we talked about, in fact, in our last 500 episode, we actually talked about one, the database as a service market. In fact, where MongoDB is actually a leader there. Now, there are some markets that are out there that are might not be trending yet. They're kind of slowly creeping along and they've been there for a while. Um, but they might have the potential to actually have massive growth in the near future. Can you guess what it is? Well, you guessed it, identity access management. I want to get my co-hosts, bring them back in in a second, but my friend Vittorio would actually be very happy about this. The Dark Reading Hour Coke actually calls out a study that this week that shows the global spending on identity and access management solutions is on pace to rise by 62% in the next five years. That's a huge, huge trend and jump. And most of that is in sub subscription models. Now, we'll get to why that is. So identity as a service is the new model. Not surprising there. Now, Juniper Research actually published this research uh, this report, and that the IT spending or IM spending will rise from the expected 16 billion this year up to 26 billion in 2027. Now SMB is driving that force. It's the driving momentum behind this. The small and business, small and medium sized business, and that's because the expense to add in the IM market was big in the past. To try to get into that market was actually really big. So mostly, most of the time, it was really big dogs and enterprises that were paying into it. Now, subscription services are actually helping that to bring that down market downstream, the SMB, so the SMBs, um, you know, they don't have a lot more as much money to to put into these things as these enterprises do. So even though they SMBs are the driving force behind identity access management. The question is there, what could actually be causing them to push this? What, what about SMBs, right? You might remember that the pandemic has pushed us to remote work. Well, the fact that SMBs have a smaller budget and they need to handle the remote work, sometimes they need to utilize, bring your own device support, right? So they cover all the costs of need for hardware in your workforce. 
Plus, there's also been uh, the explosion in the IoT market as well. So these are some of the driving forces that are causing SMBs to, to move to IAM solutions and do that in a more subscription or service-based uh, way because that's more cost-effective for them over a longer period. I want to bring my co-host back in because there's lots of questions here. Obviously, the IAM market has been around for a while. Chibert, I want to throw this to you first because the, the, you know, this has been around for a while, but we're, we're now saying, oh, wait, now there's going to be a huge explosion in this market. And we talked about some of the reasons, one of them being that the fact that you know, SMB is kind of pushing, pushing this out there. But what, what do you think could be some of the other reasons? Well, I, I think so, a lot of the reasons is we've got people doing, shall we say, they're, they're, they're having trouble implementing things like HR rules. You know, I guess that's the easiest way to say. The, the reality is if someone leaves the organization, how many things do you have to change? So 20 years ago, literally 20 years ago, Oliver Rist and I ran an identity management bake-off. Well, I can't use the word bake-off because that's owned by Pillsbury. We call them shootouts. And we got a bunch of folks in and we did a scenario of a person that gets married so you can go and trigger a name change for the, well, actually we did a, company merger first so you can merge two uh, identity trees then we did you know they got married they they so forth we call it harry met sally and it was for fergenschmeyer.com anyway that was back quite a while ago but the problem is it's really complicated i mean we had senior engineers helping us write the scripts so that someone like hr could just go and say click and we're going to disable your credentials because you're, you're under HR review. Say you get uh, terminated or something like that. Um, and you want to go and do something. But the cost was atrocious. So the wish has been there. You know, the response we got from the article was quite, quite a, a tidal wave. Everybody wanted it until they started researching how much it would cost and how much, you know, personnel cost. You know, the um, scripting required almost required a full-time person. So going back to where we are 20 years later, we have a need. Um, there are more and more regulations on how we deal with personnel. Um, we have more and more people moving around. And... We've seen lots of stories about how we've um, a person got back in to do some harm to the organization or enterprise uh, because their credentials weren't turned off quickly enough or something like that. So the wish for this capability has been here for many decades. Um, but the problem is the technology hasn't caught up. Maybe it's finally catching up. And the cloud means now we can spread the cost of development over a larger marketplace. So maybe the cloud is going to be the lever for true identity access management instead of what we were looking at back in back 20 years ago when we had to um, do everything on-prem. That's a good point. I think, you know, obviously cloud is being the driving force. You know, I mean, Curtis, I want to throw this to you because a lot of organizations, they still have, they're still in the hybrid model. They're, they're moving some of their solutions to, to the cloud, but they still have on-premise or private, private cloud solutions. Is, is, do these types of IAMs or services help with that? Is that some of the driving force as well? Well, that is some of the driving force. And one of the things that we're seeing is that there are cloud-based solutions for providing uh, identity management that go across multiple cloud or complex hybrid cloud architectures and on-prem. So one of the nice things there is that it's possible for smaller organizations to be able to have more advanced identity management because they don't have to manage, deploy, and administer every single aspect of that. They can essentially have it done as a service 
uh, where the onus within the organization falls on the HR department, uh, often acting through IT, to have the uh, cloud service or managed service provider uh, do the actual implementation of the identity management. Frankly, I think this is good because one of the things that we're seeing more and more is that poor identity management is a key component in a lot of significant data breaches. Uh, if you have good identity management, even if the, um, the malicious actor is able to make some inroads, they can't go very far because they have much more trouble finding an existing privileged file, privileged identity to use to gain access to the entire system. Yeah, I think you bring up a good point there. Obviously, having a centralized location uh, where you know organizations can actually manage their identities is very important. And especially in an SMB case where you might have a, a remote sales force that's running around all the time. And then like Cheaper said, you might have somebody, some attrition on the in the organization and you need to lock things down or ensure things are locked down. Curtis, what what do you, what about zero trust? Is this also uh, you know, again, pardon my ignorance here, is this this is is this also a driving force between some of these types of solutions? Well, zero trust is something that companies are doing. I mean, it is a great catchphrase. And it is one of the hot phrases that is being used in marketing identity uh, services. Um, and the good news is that if you properly implement a zero trust or micro segmentation architecture, then you can go a long way toward limiting the damage from any given intrusion. The bad news is that if you're going to do this, it really does require having solid identity and access management in place as the first step for your users. Without that, the zero trust means very little. So the good news is that it is driving some of the IAM uh, action. It is driving companies to want to invest in IAM. Um, the bad news is that if they want to go full zero trust, they find pretty rapidly that just having the solid identity management is just the first step. Uh, they, they have a long way to go but they do have to take that critical first step of getting the identities and access management right. Now, there are a bunch of players out there. Obviously, the big players, Okta, there's Auth0. We talked to them recently. You know, there's obviously Microsoft's in that, in that play. Uh, IBM and Oracle are also growing in that market. Um, Cheaper, I wanted to throw this to you because you, know, you had mentioned this in the back channel. I mean, obviously, there are a lot of big players that are offering support out there. But the truth is there's... There's, there's not that much diversity that they need to manage or that many platforms that they have to cover, right? Is there, there's not, there, there's, people are starting to reduce things down as they move to the cloud. Yeah. The, if anything, the cloud has forced a homogenization of authentication methodology. So that, that's a lot of multi-syllable words. But the reality <laughs> is, is if you're Putting everything in the cloud, you don't want to have to have, you know, 30 or 40 different connectors. So that was the thing that made the identity management 20 years ago so expensive. Each connector uh, was really expensive. In fact, IBM was one of the players, and we actually had a connector to an IBM um V, uh, actually, is a virtual machine running on a ThinkPad that was OS 370, a mainframe ar architecture. And uh, that was a complex beast. So because we have a lot less um, variations in where we have our data, uh, we have a lot less variations on the platforms uh, and this is being driven by the cloud. And the pandemic has actually done a lot to drive all this because more stuff had to go into the cloud um, so that we didn't have to manage as much on-prem because our workforce was off-prem. Um, anyway, we, we can spin it whichever way you want. But the reality is, is 
as I said, people wanted the capability. Um, they just couldn't justify it because it was too expensive. But when you start homogenizing the um, access management, then now all of a sudden you can spread the cost of development over a much, much wider area. So anyway, um, it was cool. We, we did some great um, testing. It was something that lots and lots of people said they wanted. Uh, but the cloud is has forced it, will force it, and the pandemic is apparently peeling the um, purse strings open to go and finally be able to pay for some of this. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how it goes because I've been, you know, I've been literally waiting 20 years to see it happen. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I, one last thing. I want to throw this back to Curtis in a second. I think the one thing that I'm seeing globally, obviously, is the more awareness around compliance management. So compliance, being compliant is very important. We talked a little bit about the fact that some organizations run into trouble when they when people leave the organization or change roles or or the fact that they need to reduce down and, and ensure that they're, you know, they're defining who their users are at any, any point. In fact, there was a recent stat that showed that 71% of organizations actually use manual processes for identity management. So, the, so having these solutions is really going to help. But Chris, I want to throw this to you because compliance is a complex thing. How will IAM solutions help? Well, with compliance, often what you're trying to do is prove that you are in compliance with given regulations. And often regulations have to do with who has access to given data and what you're doing as an organization to prevent those who are not authorized from having access to that data. If you can show a good IAM practice, if you can show that you're taking all of the steps to properly authorize and control the identities of those who have access to data, then you've taken a good step towards proving that you're in compliance with those particular regulations. And this has to do with all kinds of compliance regimes ranging from uh, HIPAA to various financial uh, regulatory regimes to some of the GDPR uh, regimes that are so important to any company that does business in Europe. Again, one of the things that you need to do is not only comply, but prove you're in compliance. And having the records and the, um, the documentation from your identity management service provider can go a long way toward making the auditors happy when you're proving compliance. Ah, uh, yes, the infamous audit trails. So I agree. If these types of solutions definitely can help there. You know, I'm, 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 these, it's hopeful to see the scale, the flexibility as part of these solutions. Uh, and now that they're trying to bring them down market, I'm hoping that I, as a developer, I can start maybe even utilizing these things in, in smaller projects just to see um, how they integrate well with, you know, software that I develop or even mobile solutions, that kind of thing. So I'm actually interested to see how this all plays out and if these subscription services are even uh, available to, uh, to, to consumers or, or whatnot too as well. We'll have to see. Well, folks, that does it for the bites. Next up, we have our amazing host roundtable. So definitely stick around for that. But before we do, we do have to thank another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's userway.org. And here's a great message directly from userway. Userway.org. I'm talking about making your website ADA compliant, accessible. Not only is it the right thing to do, because you're opening up your website to a much larger group, 60 million plus people. You have a responsibility to make your site accessible. It's a public entity, so you got to make it accessible. And with UserWay, it's easy. That was my biggest concern was, oh, I can't afford it or it's going to be too hard. No, UserWay is really affordable and it's really easy. An incredible, it's AI powered. It tirelessly enforces all the accessibility guidelines, the WCAG, WCAG guidelines. And I love this, so do our engineers. It's one line of JavaScript. That's it. Because UserWay is so good, it's used by more than a million websites, including the big guys, Coca-Cola, Disney, eBay. These are companies that really have to be accessible, and UserWay can do that. As you get bigger, they scale with you. If they can handle Disney, absolutely they can handle you. They make best-in-class, enterprise-level accessibility tools available to you, your small or medium-sized business. And then as you scale, you need UserWay, and you're ready. 
it just makes business sense. Some of the biggest problems, nav menus, very difficult. So the way this works, if you're blind or you're using accessibility tools, there is what they call an accessibility layer. That's what the screen reader sees. So really what UserWay does is make sure that all the information available to the front page to the sighted user is available to the browser in the accessibility layer. It changes colors. Now you've got your Pantone color for your business. Of course, we do too. It doesn't change that, but it adjusts hue and luminance so it's easier for people with vision issues to read. So UserWay will generate alt tags. That's one of the reasons it needs AI. It can actually see the picture and generate an alt tag that matches the picture automatically. You can go in if you want. You can modify it, of course. It fixes violations like vague links, fixes broken links, makes sure that your website uses accessible colors, and you'll get a detailed report of all the violations that were fixed on your website so you know exactly what it did. Plus, you can work with it. UserWay integrates seamlessly with your site builder software. Let UserWay help your business meet its compliance goals, improve the experience for your users. UserWay can make any website fully accessible, ADA compliant, and everyone who visits can browse seamlessly, customize it to fit their needs. It's a great way to show your brand's commitment to the millions of people with disabilities. It's the right thing to do. UserWay can make any website fully accessible, ADA compliant. With UserWay, everyone who visits your site can browse seamlessly and customize it to fit their needs. It's also a perfect way to showcase your brand's commitment to millions of people with disabilities. Go to userway.org slash twit and get 30% off UserWay's AI-powered accessibility solution. UserWay, making the internet accessible for everyone. Visit userway.org slash twit today. And we thank userway.org for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, it's now time for the host roundtable where we get to pick a topic, big or small, go deep, and it let us flex our experiences a little bit, our ex expertise a little bit for the audience. Uh, now, with the advent of the pandemic, uh, you know, we've been forcing people to work from home, to work remotely. And also the need for the corporate uh, perimeter, the network perimeter to be changed a little bit to shift the market to using more personal, more home type network equipment. Now, I'm, you know, in the past, I, I can honestly say I've gone overboard a little bit with my home network. But I can I can say that in the last couple of years, I know people who spend hundreds, if not thousands of dollars upgrading their home network and, and even way past anything I've ever done. And the truth is there's a large, massive spectrum of quality of hardware. Right. There's, there's a huge spectrum, whether it's for consumer or even SMB. Now, Chibert, I want to throw this to you first and bring us all back in, just kind of discuss it. You know, there's lots going on in this space. And I, I, I know you've kind of done a bunch of research here before, right? Yeah. In fact, I'm going to start off with referring to an InfoWorld article that I wrote many years ago, uh, universal threat management devices, UTMs, where you're combining multiple security functions in a single physical device. Uh, I happen to be one person that I run an enterprise grade firewall at home. Well, one of the things that a lot of people keep forgetting is that there is a difference between um, what is necessary in this day and age. Um, I consider a UTM as the minimum uh, entry level into this game um, because it can't just be a traditional firewall. You know, think of a f traditional firewall as a hotel with lots and lots of doors in it. And a traditional firewall only really turns off or gets rid of doors, which represent, say, like, a port for web traffic or SSH or whatever. Different network services represent doors. Well, if you remove the doors, a bad guy can't go through it. Well, a UTM in general does more than that. So a lot of times you have to open one of those doors to the general public, say web traffic. Say you want to run a um, web access to your home um, cameras. Well, that means you have to leave port 80 open, or if it's encrypted, port 443. But that means anyone can go through those doors. So a UTM with something like intrusion detection puts a bouncer at the door to check credentials, make sure it's 
what you really want. You can put filters so you can profile the data or the access in. And that's one of the things I, I talked about in that article. And the reality is it, I must have done something right because my methodologies and even some of the scripts that I did have been borrowed by lots and lots of organizations um, because it was all published under Creative Commons. Well, the problem is at the time, you know, this is, it has changed over years, but at the time, a lot of the really inexpensive firewalls uh, were based on Linux, which is all fine and good, but these manufacturers just put a Linux kernel on it. So the ports, there's all kinds of ports that were open, services that aren't needed on a firewall, things like time, things like FTP, things like SSH and all that. They were all open because all it was is a copy of Linux um, with IP tables running on it. So I guess the bottom line here is you get what you pay for. So I'm going to... Th you know, throw this open, but one of the things that I'm telling a lot of people if they ask me what kind of home, inexpensive home firewall should I get, right now my knee-jerk reaction is get something based on PF Sense. Um, there's a bunch of really good ones out there. Uh, www.pfsense.org slash products has a nice list of them. I happen to know the developers at NetGate. And they've done a mighty fine job. In fact, their their systems will actually update threat signatures, just like the really expensive enterprise-grade firewalls, so that at least once the threat has been codified um, by CERT or something like that, um, they start putting those signatures in so it can block it. Firewalla is also another good one. And what's nice about their platform is they put a lot of CPU in there because all this threat management, all this um, malware detection takes CPU time. And that's one of the problems with a lot of the really inexpensive firewalls is they don't have enough CPU. So the ones that I tested on that article um, actually let through something like 80% of the attacks that we ran. Um, there, we were using um, some automated threat uh, tools so we could attack from both inside and outside. Anyway, um, we all have our own favorites, and I'm not going to dictate that. So I, let's go back to Lou and Kurt, and let's start talking. What kinds of things have you seen um, with people talking about extending the edge of the enterprise into the home? Well, one of the things that, that I think is interesting is, you know, you often get a, a question, what makes a firewall enterprise class versus one that is a consumer-grade firewall? You know, where where is the dividing line? And for better or for worse, it's, it's a fuzzy line because at one time we might have gone with sheer bandwidth as the dividing line, but now... To be honest, some of the much more affordable consumer-priced firewalls can handle all the bandwidth you're ever going to throw at it from a home location. Um, so the answer often has to do with both the sophistication of the rules that can be put into place and especially the management of that firewall. I mean, when you think about it, a firewall is in its simplest form, a box of rules that says if a packet matches this criteria, we let it through. And if it doesn't, we stop it. That's what a firewall does. And so how sophisticated can you make those rules? Some of the most basic home firewalls or consumer firewalls come pre-configured and you're basically stuck with it. As you go up, it becomes more configurable, which is nice. It allows you to do things like be much more sophisticated with your IoT devices, um, with VPNs that you might have to your employer's network um, in terms of reporting things. But it also means that it's more complex because all of a sudden someone, 
you or someone you hire or someone at your company, we'll get to that in a moment, has to establish those rules. Now, what a lot of companies have done during the pandemic and continue to do is place enterprise class but small firewalls in their employees' homes so that they can be remotely managed. And what we find that they do is not only do the uh, VPNs back to the enterprise network, but they also do what's called VLAN tagging, where essentially they're creating multiple virtual networks inside the employee's home one that's just for the employee to get back to the enterprise network and one that the employee's family can use to do whatever it is in the employee's family is going to do. The good news here is that it not only gives better perform, um, security at the edge, but it creates a more secure residential situation for the family as, as a side benefit, and as we know, fringe benefits are things that everyone is looking for in a time of greater inflation and a more competitive job market. So one of the things I wanted to talk about on that vein is while I thought I didn't like Meraki, over time I've seen more and more of what they're producing and seeing, oh, is that what they're trying to do? Well, we've talked about Meraki and the Cisco solutions as part of the SASE conversation. And this what the Meraki Go is a relatively small combined router, VPN, and um, firewall device um, that I didn't like at first. But then as I started really taking a good hard look, especially with the pandemic, it's like, oh, neat. I can get it, give it to an employee. I can plug it in and push policies to it. Um, it can also include, as part of those policies, a separation. So you can separate the work network from the network the kids go on. In fact, that was one of the scenarios in my firewall test is little Johnny brings his laptop in that he had at school and he plugs it into dad's workplace and infects the company because he's infected and comes in behind the firewall. This is back when perimeter was the big deal. Um, but the world has changed. In fact, uh, Duo, which used to be a Twit sponsor, um, is re, I guess, publishing or re, re making available um, the information on Dan Gears' keynote from the 2014 Black Hat uh, called Cybersecurity as Real Politic. And he, he back then was really saying, no, no, the, the real edge of the enterprise isn't your corporate headquarters. It's actually the home because people are working from home. And that's what we really need to start taking a look at. So, the world has been changing, and uh, I'm, you know, I've got to imagine Mr. Liu has been really seeing a lot of the changes, especially with the direction different products have gone, and um, security requirements have changed, and that has to be affecting products. And since Liu's favorite topic is software, you know, um, what kinds of things have been changing? You know, are we actually starting to see some of the security being not assuming to be at the firewall or assuming to be at intrusion detection device, but is those policies being implemented in the software now? It's a good question. And I definitely want to get to that. But before I do, we do have to thank another great sponsor of this week on our Rise Tech, and that's New Relic. That's what if you're a software engineer like me, you've been there. It's 9 p.m. It's a weekend. It's a Sunday night. You're finally wind, unwinding from work. Your phone buzzes. That's right. It's an alert. Something's broken. Something's out there going wrong. And your mind's already racing to figure out what's going on, right? Is it the back end? Is it the front end? Is it global? Is it the server? Is it the network? Is it the cloud provider? Lots of questions going on. Is the queries, you know, for the database or this back end running slow? Did I introduce a, a bug in the last deployment? Now, the whole team's scrambling to find out what's a, what the fix actually is, right? Now, according to a new Relic report, only half 
of all organizations are implementing observability for their networks and their systems. And the report showed how maintaining network observability can, continues to be an issue for companies around the world. That won't happen if you get New Relic. Now, New Relic combines 16 different monitoring products that you'd normally buy separately so engineering teams can see across their entire software stack in one place. You'll get application monitoring or APM. It's unified monitoring for your apps and your microservices. Kubernetes and Pixie, instant Kubernetes and observability with Pixie. Distributed tracing, see all your tracings without management headaches so you can find and fix issues fast. Network performance monitoring, stop guessing where performance issues start and ditch data silos for a system-wide correlated view and so much more, a lot more going on there. Now, more importantly, you can pinpoint issues down to the line of code so you know exactly why the problem happened and can resolve it quickly. Well, that's why the dev and ops teams at DoorDash, GitHub, Epic Games, and more than 14,000 other companies use New Relic to debug and improve their software. Whether you run a cloud-native startup or a Fortune 500 company, it takes just five minutes, five minutes, to set up New Relic in your environment. So the next 9 p.m. call is just waiting to happen. Get New Relic before it does. And you can get access to the whole New Relic platform and 100 gigabytes of data free per month forever. No credit card required. Sign up at newrelic.com slash enterprise. That's N-E-W-R-E-L-I-C dot com slash enterprise. Newrelic.com slash enterprise. And we thank New Relic for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, we've had the host roundtable. We'll be talking about the large spectrum of network hardware out there and all the different advantages. And Achiever had a really good question here around software and, of course, moving some of the hardware fun functionality to the software space, whether it be services or whatnot. And, you know, I'm actually seeing this with a lot of the uh, SMB uh, devices that are out there. In fact, before I um, actually got off of the Dell device that uh, you had we we had inter interchanged before. They had upgraded the the uh, the the firmware to start allowing for some uh, intrusion detection on the device uh, based off of their AI service that they had. So like you would you would actually pipe a bunch of data up to them from your device, and it would actually come back to the device with uh, a dashboard that you could actually view that showed intrusion detection. And I think. That's a lot. A lot of that's happening all over the place. You, you'll see services that people will install on other devices within their network that will help them get visibility into the device and into the into what's going on. But again, th that's a lot of upstream. That's a lot of more expensive devices out there that require that have that capability. Uh, you know, in, in my in my quest to find a budget, if not, I would say middle of the road expensive piece of hardware that I could use both for, you know, connecting to the to the Microsoft network, um, as well as doing, you know, uh, being able to create these virtual networks so that I can have a home network and a and a, uh, a work network uh, um, separately. It, it's challenging to find that I, I tell you, I've tried everything from, um, you know, you know, we've been talking about some of these kind of cheaper brands that are out there, like uh, the Tenda Nova device, which is pretty cheap. It's, you know, 150 bucks or whatnot. But again, these are devices that that try to have the features of the big dogs, but they fall short with their software, with their, you know, with their management capabilities, with constant firmware updates. They don't do it. They don't have the firmware updates. They don't have a large ecosystem out there. Their support is not there. So that brings the next topic that I want to throw to you guys is is you know what what kind of comes with a good device whether it's inexpensive or not is is it you know i kind of listed some of them already but does are there other things or, or do those things even matter when it comes to a good device whether it's a inexpensive or a, or a expensive device well go ahead kurt no, I, I'm, my question is going to be in what, what way? Because there are certain things that you do want to have uh, included in a more expensive device. Uh, your licenses, for example, uh, which are typically going to be on an annual basis, so you'll subscribe right. annually. 
but they include updating all your definitions on a regular basis. They will uh, incorporate um, new rules to deal with newly discovered threats. It will include incorporation into the device vendor's threat detection network and threat analysis right. network. So all of those things tend to be part of the add-on that you're going to get with um, a more complete business class device. Um, and then you, you have things like you know VPN connections, VPN tunnels, although I have to say that that's one of those things that can benefit you if you are um, working somewhere else and want to get back to your home network and perhaps from there to your business uh, enterprise network, but many times, I know I have run into the case where I had a very solid enterprise class VPN capability, but my employer uh, was limited to a single VPN client that they would use, and it wasn't the one that I had, so it didn't really help. Um, the big thing, though, that you want to do more and more is be able to tap into the threat detection and analysis network of your device vendor. Most of the big firewall, enterprise firewall vendors talk about this in their marketing materials, that they tie together reports from all of their firewalls. They detect new threats quickly. They are tied with all of the global threat networks, so they know when new things are developed, they know when new vulnerabilities are discovered and can give you some cover uh, from them before they're patched. So that's a big one. You never want to be the only person looking out for new threats and new vulnerabilities. Being able to tie into a global network puts you miles ahead of most of the people out there trying to figure out what's happening in their household. You bring up a good point, Kurt. I think Chipper brought this up before, the PFSense uh, hardware that you can load on there. They bring some of these more complex uh, and advanced functionality, whether it's you know a virtual network capability, a VPN capability, that kind of thing, to some of these less expensive devices. Right, Chipper? Well, yeah. And PFSense capability-wise, I would stack up against a lot of the more expensive commercial firewalls, but there is a difference. Um, it, I think it comes down to scope and speed. How fast are malware signatures implemented? Because PFSense is using an open source repository. So getting it out to the devices takes longer than, say, a Cisco or a sonic wall, or someone like that. Um, also, scope. You know, if you're running um, in a PFSense-based firewall, you're not going to be able to easily push policies or changes or updates from a central location. So if you're running a home office where it's only you, PFSense might make a lot of um, good sense for you. But if you're running an enterprise where you're having to push to a thousand remote employees, um, PFSense is going to eat you out of house and home on labor just doing updates and you know trouble ticket calls. So it's scope and speed. How fast do you get updates? How fast do you get malware signatures? And scope, how much you can do without having to touch each individual unit. Um I, I think they're both good. I think they both are valid. Um, one of the things I did want to talk about a little bit is there are quite a few people out there, quite a few listeners, I've been getting emails from you, that are saying, well, I have such and such router and you don't seem to like it very much, but I'm on a fixed income. I'm retired. I, I can't afford to go and buy a you know, a couple thousand dollar firewall. Well, one of the things you can do is keep in mind, you're, if you're a retiree like I am, you're probably not going to be the target of hackers. So you're only needing to deal really with um, the standard stuff on the net. So one of the things you might want to do is, you know, if you've got a lot of 
kids, school age kids. Uh, school age kids are really, really bad at security. Um, you might want to separate the kids off. Use a VLAN. So there's an article um, that we just brought up that goes through what can you do? Uh, are VLANs worth it? A virtual local area network means you can segment off the kids or segment off the cameras or segment off the doorbells. Um, separate your IoT gear. You know, there might you might be using a camera that has a vulnerability, but if it's segmented off, um, there is a smaller chance that the bad guys can pivot. And that's a going to be a key word. If you have a vulnerability on your local network, there are lots and lots of tools where you can get through the vulnerability and pivot from that vulnerable piece of equipment, say a camera, and start attacking other things on your network. Well, if the other things aren't physically on your network, it can't be attacked. Anyway, you can leverage things. You can go and make the less expensive firewalls more secure. Um, so one of the things we're going to hopefully get onto the, um, the notes page is I've brought out some different resources, things like um, the LifeWire article or Wicker, W-I-C-A-R. It's an anti-malware test. You can actually go to wicker.org uh, wicker and click on I want to be tested, you know, the, the web page, and it will go and start probing backwards. How vulnerable are you? Do you have mal do is your malware uh, detection actually working? Um, so that there it is. So that's a cool free tool. There's also another um, great site from geekflare.com and it has a bunch of different tools listed on how to test your infrastructure on how well it can withstand cyber attacks. So what I used to have to do um, for the ma for InfoWorld magazine with about a million dollars worth of gear, um, you can do from the comfort of your own home. So I really, really suggest if you want to, you know, if you're worried about this, run some of the tests. See if you can reduce some of the attack footprint on your system. And keep in mind, if you live in California, there is going to be some new legislation that seems to be making it through your um, legislative body that is going to require um, vendors go through a certification process and determine how vulnerable your IoT device is. Nice step in the right direction, maybe. We'll see. Um, I think California is going to be the litmus test for the rest of the nation. We'll see how that works. Anyway, I've been rambling. I, I need to give this back to Lou and we can go and see what else we want to talk about. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I, well, I think I think you're bringing out some good things here. Like I think there's some some good things to look for, some good could, some good tools to use to utilize to determine if your hardware is worth it or up to up to date. I think what well, I'm actually taking notes here because I think that some of the things that that you, that I've seen in the past that have really helped is the fact that there, there's some level of table stakes that usually comes with a home and business network. One being that the device that you buy has to have, you know, it has to support the modern, you know, network speeds that are out there, the throughput, the number of devices. So you're saying supports the compute power as well as the number amount of memory that you can, that you need. So it needs to support your devices that you have now and some breathing room for devices later, as well as being able to support the ability to have a home network and a business network kind of running in tandem. So I think that's really kind of table stakes for people who are working remotely. Um, I, I actually wanted to add to that, that something that Kurt brought out, which is, you know, I don't buy devices that don't have a broad ecosystem. Ones that, you know, lots of people have been using, um, who've talked about it. Um, I'm not talking about reviews. I'm talking about actually util utilizing these devices and the fact that the manufacturer supports them on a continual basis, whether providing firmwares automatically um, or constant security updates, um, new features, that kind of thing that are either provided uh, to you on a on, a, on a, um, a service basis, whether you're paying a small monthly fee for them or if it's even just provided as part of the hardware. And I think that's one of the advantages even as PFSense comes along because they do provide a lot of updates and it's, uh, you know, that's the you know available to you, whether you go the actual um, 
commercial way, which is the net gateway, or you go and build your own thing. In fact, I, I was putting in the back channel here that I've seen um, somebody actually go for just 600, 700 bucks, build their own like super router that has PF sense on it that, you know, they continually update on their, on their own, but they're able to actually build their own thing just from parts from Amazon. Um, and, and, and so that gives you the ability to have a little bit more control over things, but again, you have to be, uh, you have to be managing that yourself. So I think those, those are some of the lists that I follow, obviously, is in making sure that they they're on a they're updated on a continued basis. Now, software is the big thing, and I want to just talk about that for a second. Um, you know, a lot of these uh, you know kind of cheaper brands, whether it's the Huawei brands or whatnot, that have their devices, they 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 try to do what some of the other big players are doing. They'll have like mobile app that shows you a lot of things that are going, whether it's alerting or or events that are happening or being able to update your device from there. But the software tends to fall short. Whether you know, it doesn't work, it doesn't can't connect. Um, you know, and if you're having a mess network, it's, it's not, it, it doesn't complete the network all the time. Um, so, so, so the software is there, they try to bring out the features, but it's not reliable. And I think that's the, the other thing that kind of gets added to the list for table space, ta- table stakes is that the software is reliable. It's a, your device stays up all the time. Um, it doesn't, you have to go restart it. Um, you know, the fact that, you know, you are, um, the software that you use to interact with it and get reports on is reliable and, um, and, and it's continuous. And I think that's another thing that you have to look for in a device uh, software. I've actually sent back thousands of dollars worth of network equipment, uh, because of the reliability uh, of the software. And so I, I think that's uh, another thing to add to that list. Anything else you guys want to add that I've kind of thrown out there or maybe even take away? (laughs) Well, the one thing that I would add is that in too many cases, we see people saying they want the capabilities, but on the other hand, they don't want to spend more than about $79. You know, they, they you know, and the, it, it really gets me that you have someone who's going to spend $3,000 on a television and, you know, five thousand dollars on a sound system and $400 on a blender and things like that. But the piece of equipment that can protect their entire family and the safety of all these other devices, they want to get really cheap on. Uh, You don't have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars, but you can get a good, solid device that will protect your network for, you know, a couple, 300 bucks. You don't have to spend $10,000. You can spend a few hundred dollars, get something that will protect your home network and do it for years into the future because it will be upgradable and it will be supported by the vendor. So this is not the place to cheap out. You know, go ahead, make the investment and know that it protects all the other investments you're making in technology at your home network. I want to toss out one last thing. Keep in mind, the the world is changing. The market's changing. Uh, virtualized desktops, managed desktops is becoming a real um, product line. You know, it's not as complex as it used to be. You can say, I want to buy a year's worth, and then at the end of the year, I can walk away from it. Well, one of the things that a managed desktop gives you is the vendor's infrastructure is giving us firewalls. It's giving us intrusion detections, doing all kinds of stuff. It's doing patches for you. So if you are trying to live on a budget, a managed desktop might not be a bad idea. You know, it looks expensive only because you're paying a lot of stuff up front and the company's got to make money. But look at the total cost of ownership. Um, You don't have to buy an enterprise-grade firewall. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. Um, Managed desktops, nine times out of ten, can be accessed from a really inexpensive Chromebook. So that means you can do it for your kids. You can do it for, you know, everybody in your family. And now maybe you don't care so much for that home firewall that might cost you a lot. There are no standard answer. There's no cookie cutter answer. Everybody's life is different. Everybody's home is a little different. Everybody's needs are different. Um You need to take a good, hard look. I personally tell people, make a needs list, make a wants list. So the needs have to be features that are there. 
the wants are, okay, I'm not going to say no, but gee, it would be really nice if we had this, this, and this. Um, write it down. Don't just go to a store and buy something because the salesman is you know, going to sell you whatever's on the shelf. Um, take a good hard look. You know, sometimes roll your own because PF Sense is open source. You can go and build yourself a PF Sense machine relatively inexpensively and still get a lot of the protection that you would have in a multiple thousand dollar firewall. But just keep in mind, you also bought into supporting it yourself. So you get what you pay for. I guess that's kind of my bottom line. You get what you pay for. It's true. It's true with everything that you uh, you buy nowadays when it comes to tech, at least, the tech, at least. Uh, I think there's a lot more to talk about here. In fact, I, you know, I was going to jump maybe into uh, the uh, some of the anomaly detection that was added just recently to my uh, to my device. <clears throat> but uh, unfortunately, that will have to wait till next time because time flies when you're having fun. And we're at the end of the episode. You've done it again. You sat through another hour of the best thing, enterprise and IT podcast in the universe. I think we proved it today. So definitely tune your podcatcher to Twyat. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my co-host. That's right. Starting with our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, I know you're very, very busy in the next in the coming weeks. Where can people find you, all your work, and what's going on? Well, there there are several places they can find me. One, of course, is at Dark Reading, the slash Omdia uh, tab. I will be writing there. Uh, I'm trying to do a little bit more over on LinkedIn. I've done a couple of articles there that have done well, so follow me on LinkedIn. I also have a YouTube channel. I've got uh, a Twitter account, KG4GWA, where I do my very best to point to the other things I'm doing. So follow me on Twitter. Um, and I, as you say, I'm traveling. Uh, the ones that I know about are Boston in a couple of weeks. And then, of course, back out to the desert. And I really am looking forward to hearing from and even meeting members of the Twyatt Riot while I'm out there on the road. Thank you, Curtis. It's great to hear you, have you here and great to hear about what you're, work, work, what you're working on there. Well, we also have to thank our very own Mr. Brian Chi. Chibert, what's going on for you in the coming weeks and where can people find you? Well, I want to do a shout out to Mr. Chickenhead21. Um, he was making a comment about, you know, everybody assumes that their antivirus software will protect them. I have a mantra and my mantra is trust but test. So because the wicker.org website is free and you can go and test things, and it uses what are called simulated loads. They're not real malware, but they have the same kinds of signatures. Um, test it. Now, one thing I do tell people, if you're going to do this and you're doing it at work, warn your IT group. Otherwise, if they are monitoring, they are going to freak out uh, because it'll look like an attack. So, but from home, test it, you know, is your, is your system updating? You know, are you running a real malware piece or are you running FUDware um, test? Anyway, um, you're welcome to throw me questions. Um, I do a pretty decent job of answering. And on Twitter, I am A-D-V-N-E-T-L-A-B, Advanced Net Lab. And that goes back to the days of doing testing for InfoWorld magazine when I believe I was the largest lab for InfoWorld. Um, people have been asking me questions about different things. Uh, some I'm actually still getting questions about the old firewall test because so many people have grabbed my scripts and my methodologies. Um, you're also welcome to throw an email at me. I'm Chebert, spelled C-H-E-E-B-E-R-T, at twit.tv. Or you can throw email at twiet at twit.tv and you can hit all the hosts. Would love to hear from you. Would love to hear show um, ideas. And um, you people seem to be liking the host roundtables. The number of comments have tailored down a little bit, but uh, I think you folks are still happy with them. So we're going to keep trying to schedule them. Thank you, Chibert. Well, we also have to thank you as well. You're the person who drops in each and every week to watch and listen to our show to get your enterprise goodness. We want to make it easy for you to listen 
and catch up on your enterprise and IT news. So go to our show page right now, twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll find all the amazing back episodes. Of course, the show notes, co-host information, guest information. Of course, the links of the stories that we do during the show. But more importantly, next to those videos there, you get those helpful subscribe and download links. Support the show by getting your audio version or video version of your choice. Listen on any one of your devices. Check out any one of your podcast applications because we're on all of them. So definitely subscribe and support the show. Plus, you may have also heard that's right. We also have Club Twit. Love Club Twit. It's a members only ad free podcast with that bonus Twit Plus feed. You really can't get anywhere else. It's only $7 a month. And there's a lot of great features here. In fact, one of them is the exclusive access to the members only Discord channel. You can chat with hosts, producers, separate discussion channels. Plus, there's special events on there. Lots of fun stuff on there. So definitely check that out. Join Club Twit. Be part of the fun. Go to twit.tv slash Club Twit. Now, Club Twit now offers group cor- corporate group plans as well. It's a great way to give your team access to our ad-free tech podcast. The plans start with five members at a discount rate of $6 each per month, and you can add as many seats as you like. This is a great way for your IT department, your developers, your sales team, your tech team to stay up to date on and have access to all of our podcasts. And just like that regular, regular membership, you can join the Twit Discord sense, uh, server as well, and also get the access to the Twit Plus bonus feed as well. So that's twit.tv slash club twit. Now, after you subscribe, you can impress your friends, your family members, your coworkers with the gift of Twi. We talk about a lot of fun tech topics on this show, and I guarantee they will find it interesting and fun as well. So definitely subscribe to our podcast. Now, I've already subscribed, and you're available on Friday, 1 30 p.m. Pacific time. We do this show live. That's right. Come see the behind the scenes. Come see how the pizza's made. Come see all the banter that we do, all the fun we have here on Twit. That's at live.twit.tv. We have a bunch of stream options there. Plus, if you can watch the show live, you can also jump into our chat room as well. IRC, our famous IRC channel, irc.twit.tv, the Twit Live channel in there. We have a lot of great people in there. Each and every week, people jump in. Uh, they join, but we also have some new players in there as well. So a lot of great things going on uh, in there. So definitely join the conversation, join the fun. We take live questions from there, lots of discussion points. So be part of that as well. IRC.twit.tv. Definitely hit me up, twitter.com slash Luamam. Also, I'm on LinkedIn, Louis Moresco on LinkedIn. Hit me up there. I post enterprise tidbits. I have, great, I have great conversations. In fact, I get a lot of direct messages on Twitter, also on LinkedIn for, for show ideas, uh, guests, hosts, that kind of thing. So definitely hit me up there. I love hearing from you guys. Uh, like Chibert says, uh, lots of great topics and questions. Um, if you're interested in what I do at, my, at Microsoft, you can check out developers.microsoft.com slash office. There we post all the latest and greatest ways to customize your office solution, whether it's scripts or it's uh, online or it's macros, however you want to do it, we have it on there. Uh, I'm a little, I love talking a little bit about the web add-ins that we develop at, uh, at Microsoft and they can also be developed by you as well. So definitely check it out there. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support these Sweet Enterprise Tech each and every week, and we really couldn't do the show without them. So thank you for all your support each and every week. I also want to thank all the engineers and staff at Twit. Of course, I want to thank Mr. Brian Chi one more time. He's not only our co-host, but he's also our tireless producer. He does all the show bookings and the plannings for the show. We really good, couldn't do the show without him. So thank you, Cheaper, for all your support. And of course, before we sign out, we have to thank our editor, Anthony. He makes us look good after the fact. And of course, our TD for today, Mr. Ant Pruitt. He's the famous Ant for, uh, Mr. Ant Pruitt. He does an amazing show called Hands On Photography, which I watch each and every week religiously. Ant, what's going on on uh, Hands On Photography this week? Thank you, Mr. Lou. Uh, yeah, this week I was able to chat with someone that I knew from a few years back in Charlotte that has basically turned their photography passion into a business, my man, Mr. Michael Wilson. And it's been great just watching his progress uh, and seeing how it's it's legit. It's a legit business for him now, doing headshots. So go check it out, twit.tv slash hop. I love hearing about people's skill and how they turn it into businesses. So I'm definitely going to watch that show. Thank you, Ant, for being here and supporting the show. Well, until next time, I'm Louis Moresca. Just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Is that an iPhone in your hand? Wait a second. Is that an Apple Watch on your wrist? 
And do I, do I see an iPad sitting there on the table? Oh my goodness. You are the perfect person to be watching iOS Today, the show where Rosemary Orchard and I, Micah Sargent, talk all things iOS, tvOS, watchOS, HomePod OS. It's all the OSs that Apple has on offer, and we show you how to make the most of those gadgets. Just head to twit.tv slash iOS to check it out.